Hello, thank you. Thank you for your patience. All right. So uh, again, getting your names down. Hope you guys are doing okay. As we get into uh, the subject of uh, Woodrow Wilson and um, World War One, the Great War, as they called it at that time. So with this one, what I do is I get into oftentimes the uh, the fact that there are a few. Um, kind of polarizing figures in American history as far as leaders who, um, you know, seem to be uh, riddled with, with opposing juxtapositions, you know, like they have um, certain things about their personality, certain things about their behavior. And then you have other components to them that seem to be just the opposite that seem to contradict those that very behavior, those very characteristics. So oftentimes they uh, ascribe terms like enigma, right? Like a puzzle uh, to to such leaders. So we've done one in class today and in, uh, in class this semester, and that was uh, William McKinley, right? That he was uh, supposedly a dove, but then he really helped out big business, uh, gain a lot of. Um, acquire a lot of land and resources in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, et cetera, uh, once we got involved in the war. And uh, another one is from your other U.S. history class is um, Thomas Jefferson, his contradictions of being uh, a, quote, liberal man of wanting enlightened change and being very conservative in other ways that we don't have time to get into. It's a whole other course. But this is another one, is uh, Woodrow Wilson. Okay, Woodrow Wilson, um, well, you go into, with Woodrow Wilson, his um, his rhetoric, like what he claims that he stood for, right? And you watch what happens here in the war, uh, leading up to war, and the popular interpretation is, is that it, it sickened uh, Woodrow Wilson, that he he felt above it. He felt that the U.S. were above it, okay? Um, all this land grabbing, all these uh, behind-the-scenes um, contingency alliances that we're going to get into, um, just uh, suppression of, of the national uh, will of a lot of different ethnic groups and so forth, uh, supposedly uh, kind of sickened him. And so he saw this war as a war that easily could have been avoided and was the fault of virtually all of those uh, major powers uh, who were, who were um, fighting it, okay? Matter of fact, he has something called a famous December letter in which he pr pretty much says that. It's so insulting uh, to the British and to the French that they refuse to uh, even even ponder the possibility of allowing him uh, to mediate a, a peace. That's what he does in this famous December letter. As you may know, that World War I, um, it erupts in August of 1914, and it lasts until November of 1918. And what, the U.S. does not get involved until 1917. All right, so we got involved just at the end of the war, uh, we supposedly deliberately stayed out of the war for that amount of time under Woodrow Wilson, all right? So at any rate, um, take a look at the alleged origins. Uh, this is kind of an old school interpretation uh, that you have, um, uh, you know, uh, these these multinational empires, right? Uh, the the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, they were not having anything to do with nationalism, which was becoming in vogue uh, in literature, 
uh, in um, political movements in the late 1800s and in the first decade or two of the 1900s. And so that that frightened uh, peop, uh, establishments like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who contended that um, you know because they they had they had sway over Romanians, Poles, Slavics, Croatians, um, Bosnians. Um, um, I think I already said Poles already, uh, Ukrainians, Czechs, etc. And so uh, they didn't want to give independence to these people. And so that was not in their best interest as a conservative, somewhat kind of archaic institution, being a multinational uh, empire that was ruled still by an emperor who was the emperor of uh, Austria and hence also the king of the Magyars, of, of the Hungarians, of Hungary. All right. He had a nobility still. Remember, Aristoi means the best with aristocracy. So you have a group of people that contend by their bloodline that they have special, um, you know, uh, special claims to uh, lands, resources, titles, uh, opportunities, economic opportunities, uh, political uh, posts and positions that that common people do not have access to. And they did not, um, they didn't apologize for this. And remember, yes, we've had uh, not only the American Revolution over here, uh, if you call it that, but also the French Revolution back in France, right? So these 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 multinational empires knew of these newer ideas, right? They were just stubbornly opposed to them and kind of archaic that way. And so then uh, Germany... Um, Germany united 39 different states in 1871 under the leadership of Prussia and um, the military leaders of Germany. And um, they were becoming a powerhouse economically and militarily very quickly since their unification. And before you know it, the, the Austrians who speak German, right, uh, had bloodline connections uh, to uh, the Kaiser, the German emperor, et cetera. And um, they um, they began making contingency alliances. But actually, they it wasn't they who did it first. Um, the French. The French were tired of the Germans uh, bullying them around. There were a couple Franco-Prussian wars uh, in which the, the Prussians defeated the French. And so then there was this fear that, you know, the Germans became the bully. And now that they're united... The 39 states are united. How much more are they uh, on the, you know, the border of France, uh, an immediate threat to the French? So at any rate, the French, um, they had an immediate concern. But then they also had common cause and common concerns or common um, imperialistic designs uh, elsewhere. North Africa, uh, some parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some parts of the Near East, um, et cetera. And so um, uh, also uh, uh, present day Vietnam. And so um, what they would began doing is they, they began making kind of quid pro quo agreements with one another. So the, the, the um, French began making these such agreements with the Russians, uh, strange bedfellows, right? Saying, hey, you... Uh, you recognize what we we're claiming in North Africa and elsewhere, and we'll push for your claims when we have these conventions, these European conventions um, next year. Because ever since Napoleon, they had something known as the Concert of Europe in which the European statesmen would meet, try to pan out their designs so that they don't go to war with one another. And make sure that nothing too radical of a you know of a, a movement like the French Revolution uh, could uh, you know uh, become inflamed out of control again. So the contingency, meaning like the what if, right? The worst case scenario, they started saying, okay, um, if you if I get attacked, we the French get attacked by Germany. 
Russia, will you um, support us in fighting against um, the uh, the Germans? And so that's what happened is you have these contingencies that are tied up into the concert of Europe, drama each year, and carving up parts parts of the of the quote developing world, uh, competition, egos, etc. So Woodrow Wilson looks at all this and says, man, I, I, this all could have been avoided. This all could have been avoided. All right. And so um, at any rate, what finally gets it going, I'm sure you guys recall uh, from high school, is uh, Serbia, right? Uh, the, the Balkans, you see, see there by uh, this great, this uh, beige area right here, uh, where Greece is the bottom of. So Albania, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, etc. The Balkans there, uh, they fought free and won their freedom from the Ottoman Empire, which was another multinational empire, right? Run by the Turks here in Turkey. Well, no sooner were they independent than they had the Austro-Hungarian Empire laying claims to take them over next. And then they had a civil war or two amongst one another. And the Serbians got the better of it. So the Serbians became to be, in some people's eyes, um, a threat. All right. To the Austro-Hungarians, especially, the Serbians not only were that presently the strongest of the Balkan people and most well-organized, uh, after their independence from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but there were other cousins to the Serbs that were all throughout the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so that if, if, the, if they did not keep the Serbs in line down beneath them, what might happen is they might get a pan-Slavic movement, which in literature was already very popular, right? Uh, people from the same Slavic roots, like Russia, Serbia, etc., um, unite and have our own homelands, right? So at any rate, the Austro-Hungarians were able to work it out, maneuver it in one of the Congresses that they were given claim uh, to Serbia. But um, the emperor, Franz Joseph, in sending his uh, nephew, Franz Ferdinand, and Franz Ferdinand's wife, Sophia, that was meant to be an almost supposedly um, gesture of goodwill, of, of, um, you know, of mitigating circumstances, because the nephew was quite liberal uh, for the position he was in, uh, next in line for the Austrian throne. He wanted more self-determination for the different ethnic groups within the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. He wanted Serbia to have limited local autonomy and to be able to elect people into their uh, their their Bundesliga, their their Bundesliga. That's a soccer thing. That uh, their Reichstag, their parliament, um, their Reichstag, and. Um, so at any rate, when he came down, he did not expect, he, he, he expected goodwill, that it was known that he meant the Serbs nothing but good and that they could find compromise, right? But instead, when he came down, uh, he and his wife were assassinated uh, by Gavrilo Princip. And then when they were assassinated, of course, the uncle made a demand that the uh, terrorist group known as the Black Hand in Serbia uh, have all its members brought over for justice. The Serbian government have full transparency and deliver all criminal records over to uh, the Austrian authorities. And the Serbians, you know, for their part of kind of, you know, also helping to start this war, uh, were, were quite reluctant to the point of stubborn and defiant. And what would give them that confidence to defy, as you see here, such a, a, a larger uh, empire. As remember, I mentioned the Serbs were a Slavic people. So they had already enlisted the help, the contingency help of Russia. 
So now with the Austrians moving down, the Serbians, the first uh, army to mobilize were the Russians, I believe. And they mo mobilized their, uh, their army towards Serbia uh, in through Romania. And, um, and now the Austro-Hungarians knew that they had bitten off more than they can chew uh, with the, the, the large uh, Russian army. Although, you know, the Russian army was was lacking in, in modern um, technological expertise, as, as you saw in the uh, the the um, the quick war with the Japanese uh, for Manchuria and other islands, uh, they did not fare well. But at any rate, you can make an easy guess who the Austro-Hungarians applied to, and that was Germany. So Germany says, don't worry about Russia. Uh, we've got Russia handled. Russia is not worried about Germany because Russia all along has had France as its ally. And then France, by this time, has finally brought England out of its, quote, splendid isolation from all this diplomatic drama, uh, largely because they say um, the Moroccan crises scared the British government, and I don't have time to get into those. And then also the, um, what else was it? The uh, Ad, um, Alfred von Tirpitz of the German Navy, he declared a naval race against England, between Germany and England. So that was enough to um, frighten England into an alliance. So now here are the major powers fighting it out. So it was uh, Austria-Hungary, Germany, uh, the Ottoman Empire, right, against France, Russia, England. And then I always forget with Italy because they there's a lot going on, going back and forth with Italy in both world wars, uh, but especially this one. It was mainly against, Italy was mainly against us, obviously, in World War II. So here's some of the things that Woodrow Wilson, before the war is even over, before we were even in to the war, starts saying we need to have open covenants of peace. No secret treaties. No secret contingency alliances. Absolute freedom and navigation of the seas. We're going to get into that. Anyway, you could read them. It's 14 points. So yeah, that's that's Ferdinand and Isabel, uh, uh, Ferdinand and Sophia. And um, this is Gavrilo Princip who killed them. So by the way, here's the popular narrative before I get into numbers one and two. Here's the popular narrative of our involvement in, um, in the Great War. So that's Russia with the Tsar. As you know, before the war will be over, they'll have their Bolshevik Revolution, right, with uh, Vladimir Lenin. And they will kill the royal family. And declare a new socialist republic. So look what he starts off with. He writes letters to the Warhawk senators saying we must join the war. And he writes against them. Okay, so I'm, I'm pleading the case for Woodrow Wilson's earnest desire to be neutral. 
he got to a point where he refused to read newspapers because he saw how slanted they were and how pr deliberately provocative they were in trying to provoke a feeling of indignation or anger toward one power over an, or another. His December letter, as I mentioned, uh, offered to uh, intervene and try to uh, bring about peace on terms that, upon which everyone could agree. But like I said, with the, the verbiage of the December letter, he pretty much says that there's nothing really worthwhile that they were fighting for, that it could have been avoided. And um, yeah, so like I said, he has a, a bit of a, a self-righteous um, tone to it that the English and French didn't take too kindly to. Uh, and you have to remember that Woodrow Wilson is the first PhD uh, university professor president that we had, right? Winning in 1912 on a progressive ticket. Uh, ban on loans to belligerents. So he noticed that oftentimes in history, the side that owes you money is usually the side that you go with because you want your money back. So he tried to enforce through Congress laws that you could not lend to I, any government on I, any side. Because according to international law, right, you are not to engage in contraband. You are not to engage in selling arms and ammunition, et cetera, to any one single country. But non-contraband, including just money, that technically was not illegal. And he was trying to go to take it to that far step. Uh, his cabinet choices were deliberately doves. Uh, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan did not want war. Neither did the leader of the Navy, Josephus Daniels. And then after his declaration speech for Congress to declare war eventually, uh, he supposedly uh, told uh, rebuked the crowd for, for clapping uh, at his speech. And he said, basically, how dare you clap? Uh, this speech is going to end with the death um, of a myriad of American boys. All right. So he has a quote, even when he says, Americans try to must be neutral in thought as well as in action. Uh, with immigrants, he was afraid that they would be torn. Uh, the Irish were for anybody who fought against the English. And then the Germans uh, had a pretty significant demographic here by that time. And he did not want the immigrant uh, lobbyist groups to sway any the the country in, in foreign policy all right well supposedly the book that i had was very un it was unsatisfying it says that he was eventually convinced that it not only was not um feasible but that it was economically harming our our creditor class uh, our, our business class of, of lenders that eventually we need to open up the opportunity for them to lend to both belligerents both sides and so they did but note more was lent to the triple entente of england france and russia all right The British blockade around north, around the, the Danish coast and uh, the German coast, the French coast, they're trying to starve the Germans into submission. And the British were violating international law by stopping our merchant ships from America and confiscating the goods without, com without compensation. Well, supposedly, President Wilson 
sends a letter uh, to the English government, an ambassador, asking for compensation for our, our merchants, that this cannot go on. However, the Germans, they began unrestricted submarine warfare. So basically, instead of put, letting the periscope up and betraying where they are, this is before radar, uh, they began shooting uh, by sound, sound waves, etc. cetera, uh, those ships coming near them. And so they ended up taking out some, um, you know, uh, uh, civilian, like, uh, cruisers, the Lusitania, the Arabic, the Panther, okay? And to this, of course, Woodrow Wilson sends a very stern ultimatum to the Germans, saying that if they continue their unrestricted submarine warfare, that we will cut off diplomatic relations and begin mobilizing our army. So much bigger, stronger, threatening response to the Germans, right, than to the English, when both were violating our rights on the high seas of trade and travel. But you could probably easily guess what... Um, Woodrow Wilson is going to say as his uh, his um, justification for this, this difference is that English violations were taking merely money, but German violations were taking human lives, which to him was much more grave. So after the Sussex went down, the Germans supposedly gave us the Sussex pledge that they would stop. Okay. Then there was a Zimmerman note. And the Zimmerman note was caught and brought into the to to the press, right, from the German government. And it supposedly spoke of offering Mexico the states it had lost to the U.S. in the far west back to her if she fought with Germany should America declare war on Germany. From everything I read, that had more of a incendiary effect on the public than it did on our government. Maybe our government knew something. I don't know. But then it didn't take long. And for one, Woodrow Wilson's wife dies. And he starts having like an emotional breakdown. And then he begins dating a, a younger woman named Edith Galt. And spending a lot of time with a, a friend known as Colonel House. And a lot of people didn't know why they called him Colonel, because he was not a colonel in the armed forces. And then you get quotes from him during this kind of almost transitional stage in Wilson's persona, his life. It says, nearly all principles that we hold dear Gray is the ambassador from England. So he's telling the ambassador from England, you guys are fighting for nearly all principles that we hold dear. Well, as time goes by, and needless to say, uh, Edith Galt and Colonel House both, for whatever their personal reasons were, uh, were uh, as, you know, kind of ear, uh, uh, kind of voices in the ear of Wilson on a daily basis. They both 
wanted, supported, uh, going to war against Germany. And the, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. Then, Erich Ludendorff, one of the two military dictators during the war, reinstitutes unrestricted submarine warfare. And this was supposedly a strategic gamble. Supposedly, the Germans felt like they had the Allies on their heels. And they felt like the benefit of squeezing them by way of an embargo around the island of England and Scotland and Wales would be worth the risk of provoking the entrance of the U.S., because of time, the Germans calculated that it would take the Americans a year at least to mobilize their economy, to mobilize their armed forces, and to get their boys over there in fighting fashion and fighting shape uh, to, to contribute in the war. And the Germans figured by then it would be too late. They would have won. So it's a calculated risk that did not work. And it also, it is the technical reason why we went to war in the Great War, right? Is the Germans announced the reinstitution of unrestricted submarine warfare, which was a direct violation of our international rights of safe travel and of trade as a neutral nation. All right, and the next one, now we got to go back to the to the handout. Mm. So number one is pretty easy. Wilson's Whig inclinations rendered him pro-Triple Entente, not neutral. Woodrow Wilson was a professor of political science. And in political science, he was a classic Whig, W-H-I-G, in his ideals and his values. Remember, Whigs felt that democratization socially, politically, economically, and society is the natural trend and is the best trend for society to go to. Okay. So at any rate, um, he looked at European history and you would think, right, when I was reading this, I thought, oh, wow, then maybe he was, you know, for the French Revolution. It's, you know, it's such an abrupt, you know, uh, institution institutionalization of like enlightened and liberal change. Um, but no, to him, that was too radical, too quickly, too much, too soon. He liked incremental change, right? Step by step by law, not by, you know, um, upheaval. Becoming more and more democratic. So in his book, who did he praise? He praised England. And we have that book of his to look at, to think, okay, well, there you go, right? Yeah, it was before he became president. But that that's... That's where he stood. That's when he had the the um the latitude, right? The room, the wiggle room, uh, to be who he was and to be honest with his principles when he was an academic. 
and he showed his colors. He was a Whig who was impressed primarily with England. So when he looked at places, right, like the Ottoman Empire, Sharia Muslim law over people, so no separation of, of you know, church and state, um, no representative body elected by the people. It just the list goes on and on. No way. The, the Ottoman Empire would not have met his criteria for a progressive modern society at all. And even the Germans, right? Because I've already mentioned the Austro-Hungarians and how kind of archaic they were. But even the Germans, the chancellor was not elected amongst the majority parliament, a majority party in parliament. Um, elections were not general and popular anyway. And the upper house was led by the Junker class of aristocrats who had checks over the lower house of the Reichstag. In case of military emergency, they gave virtual dictator status to two military generals, Hindenburg and Ludendorff. None of those things would have impressed Woodrow Wilson. He would have seen all that as archaic. And the Prussians, in particular, of the 39 states of Germany, Prussia alone really had a reputation for bullying other German states as well as the French, the Danish, etc. So when the ships were sunk and American lives were lost on some of these ships, his messages to the German government, he said, I will not tolerate this Prussian aggression. And he was a PhD Princeton professor. He knew as of 1871, they were all just technically Germans now. But he was making a statement, right? A pejorative statement that they were acting like the old school Prussians. So anyway, it's nothing that um, profound of a thesis, but just that. As I say that, no, there was a side to this man that probably wanted to get involved in the war eventually to make sure that the right side won, right? So that its principles could prevail in Europe. And that right side was England and France. Russia, he said, is just a strange bedfellow. by England and France. And then number two, this comes from the textbook that I sometimes use for the, ta the class, which I didn't this time. Very simple thesis, right? And it just gives the same argument time and time again. Is Woodrow Wilson did not practice what he preached. So why is that? Why is that? All right. So each time this author and I trying to paraphrase it in this number try to convey and try to make it look as if Wilson feels as if he has no choice but to go against his own belief system 
because of the circumstances. Because whether you believe in this thesis or not, right, I think it is reasonable to ask the rhetorical question is, is it not much easier to be ideologically consistent as a university professor than it is a president? Yeah, by all means, you're standing up before a class lecturing and correcting papers, etc. By all means, do your best and 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 you should be able to achieve your goal of staying ideologically consistent in all that you attest to believe in. But throw someone in the White House with this problem after that problem, this dilemma after that dilemma. And then some say that you now can no longer afford to be idealistically consistent. Now you have to become more pragmatic and simply do what works, what fits in that given situation. So by all means, let me know to what extent you believe that Alan Brinkley and I uh, let Woodrow Wilson off the hook too easily. So he needs fighters. He asked the states for volunteers. The numbers were a joke. So he grudgingly said, fine. I'll institute a draft. Right. And he had written that that is part of a, a remnant of a bygone political system and age when a strong central government and one executive leader can call young men overseas to their death. He had written about that. And now here he was issuing a draft. He tried to help out conscientious objectors. Then here's a hard one. To swallow. He needs to make war material. In his rhetoric, he said he was going to break up the big trust. He was going to break up big business and give the mom and pop shops a chance again in the economy. He said that in 1912, running for office. But here, he now he needs, of the utmost speed, he needs trucks. And by the end of the war, we're finally making our own tanks. At first, we were using French tanks, buying them. Uh, guns. And we need them... <laughs> we need them like yesterday. And we, we need them en masse. We need them in mass. Lots of quantity. So what's he going to do? Make hundreds of different different deals with mom and pop shops to make these guns, etc.? No. That's not practical. So he goes to the hated big businessman that he said he was going to squash when he was running for president. And he engages in making lucrative contracts with them that made them rich instead. Building the war machine.
And granted, he tried when choosing those who received the contracts. He tried to have some labor union leaders help make the decisions so that they could punish the big businesses that were awful to their unions. But that didn't always happen. Then when war was declared, the left, boy, the left erupted. According to Howard Zinn's book, the state of Washington, California, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, um, Colorado, all these areas where these workers and mines and these other factories, um, they refused to make anything that contributed to the war effort. They didn't want to you know, make anything that was going to end up killing another human being. Because remember, a lot of these, like the, the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, the IWW, they felt like they taught a country is just a false identity that workers are given to give them a false sense of having the same interest as their employers and as the business class, et cetera. I said, when in reality, it is the industrial workers themselves all over the world who are a common family. And so they were saying by this time, right, that these were rich, aloof political leaders who got us in, got the world into World War I. And now, like pawns, they were going to draft and send working class boys to go kill one another from different countries. So on those principles, right, the Wobblies and others, they were like, oh, heck no, we're not joining this war effort. Uh, the, the German workers are our brothers, you know. So he went after their material. He basically deprived them of their uh, First Amendment rights. But also there was Mitchell Palmer episode, A. Mitchell Palmer. Uh, a. Mitchell Palmer was really going after them to begin with, to be fair, already. And then someone blew up his house. And so then after that, it was like a blank check was given against the Wobblies and the American Socialist Party and some of the other far left uh, uh, parties and, and uh, labor unions where they came to their, their premises and they, they uh, came in without knocking took anything to find if they could find any indicting material that demonstrated that there was a desire to overthrow the government or to uh, uh, destroy property, to take lives. They made mass arrests, sometimes deportations, which were bizarre, where they would just drive them out in the middle of the desert and let them go. I kid you not, according to Zinn. And so he really kind of went to war, his administration, against the far left because they were clearly being unpatriotic and uh, being a thorn in his side. And there was a guy named Carl Schenk. And um, he was uh, telling the people not to uh, uh, to defy the draft and to instead uh, raise up arms against the U.S. government that wants to send them to go kill other workers, etc., right? So he was arrested, and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court. He was claiming his First Amendment rights. And he lost in this famous case under the clear and present danger clause, right? That if your expression creates an environment of clear and present danger, then you cannot 
engage in that expression. So then further, Congress passed the Espionage Act. Now, now it is Congress, but the president was regularly going to Congress, interacting with them, signed it, etc. So it's not as if they did it outside of his, you know, knowledge and support. The Espionage Act forbade any behavior or even mere verbal or written expression that encouraged insubordination and or impeded the war effort. All right. So they began making mass arrests under the Espionage Act. And how ironic, right? Because Woodrow Wilson was all about individual autonomy, the individual being the master of his own destiny. And having the right to freely think, etc. The Committee on Public Information uh, engaged with uh, leaflets and speeches at movie theaters, etc. Um, whereby they... Uh, they try to um, generate a patriotic fervor for the war. But when you look at the CPI posters and stuff, they look pretty, um, pretty primitive. A gorilla with the, um, the Kaiser's helmet. Uh, has a hold of Lady Liberty, and he's carrying her away. And by the way, with the war itself, is a... Uh, our boys, you know, I've heard two expressions, uh, one, two sources, uh, one from the money that they brought with them, two from the sleeping bags that look like a uh, rolled dough on the top of their backpacks that they carried with them. Uh, but for whatever reason, they called our young men doughboys uh, over in France. And so that's a name that you usually find with American soldiers during World War One. And so with American doughboys, um, you can find instances of great heroism. Uh, Mount Falcone, uh, uh, Chateau Thierry, uh, Bella Wood, where the Marines were named the Devil Dogs. Um, uh, the other places as well. But the main thing is, as far as our troops, okay, and the, the outcome of the war is the number, okay? When they were finally fighting in the uh, the, the last uh, Mu-Argon offensive, uh, M-E-U-S-E, -E, and then A-R-G-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, uh, Argon offensive, that we had a million and a half doughboys uh, in the midst of that. Uh, toward the end of the war. And so when the Germans received the, the infamous ultimatum to sue for peace, right, that was very um, disgraceful to the subsequent generation, they supposedly literally mentioned, uh, Ludendorff and other leaders mentioned American numbers in making their decision to, to do so, to sue for peace. So our numbers alone mattered. Our numbers alone seem to have helped um, secure allied victory uh, in um, the First World War. 
All right. And then a couple other things uh, to note of the soldiers. Uh, there was you you get a lot on the um, the friction between um, uh, officers and uh, foot soldiers. Uh, officers, all they had to have was a um, a college education, and they were you know put in an officer position. So sometimes having no you know experience over their their subordinates, um, and it sometimes showed, and so there was resentment. Um, sometimes it cost in lives, et cetera. And so, yeah, that, that didn't, that didn't bode well, uh, between officers and men over there. Um, also they tried progressive controls, uh, with our soldiers. Uh, they tried hello girls, uh, young women to come and dance with, have tea and, and dine with the men, but not sleep with them and to keep it clean um and to try to be a serve as a substitute for uh french prostitutes uh over there um and that was just one of the more salient examples of the the president trying these progressive reforms uh to keep the boys uh innocent over there in europe but the common expression is, is that they did not stay that way um and then you also have the uh, the Lafayette Squadron and other African Americans, who when they came over, um, there was friction. You guys also between us and the French. Um, the French had a a, a man named uh, Ferdinand Foch, and Ferdinand Foch was in control of all Allied troops, and so he told Americans where to go, what what uh, formations to form, etc. And there was a lot of resentment amongst American officers and foot soldiers about that. And because there was feeling as if he was throwing Americans in the most dangerous things uh, kind of angrily because Americans had taken so long to join the war. And um, so you have that. But when Ferdinand Foch immediately demanded uh, control of the American soldiers, uh, the um, the American leaders like Pershing uh, initially said no. Of course, they're going to end up having to give in. But when they initially said no, they said, of course, under such racist circumstances, you could have our Negroes instead. So a lot of our black soldiers went and fought with the French brigades. And supposedly it was a very enlightening um, experience for the black soldiers. When they came home, a lot of it leads to like the Harlem Renaissance and uh, the great migration up into the North uh, of African-Americans getting a taste of being treated like human beings. And um, yeah. All right, so um, I think that's about it as far as my major, um, major questions uh regarding regarding world war one for the next test all right so anyone have any questions anyone at all All right. All right. If you guys are okay, I'm okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and call it a day. Um, good luck with everything. Thank you, Giovanna. You have a great day as well, my soul. Giselle, thank you. Kaylin, thank you. Marco, have a great day. Elizabeth. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone.